We're just so thankful uh, that you are logging on. We are just so happy that you're here. My name is Nate Maddox, the senior pastor. And we would just ask for maybe you to uh, like this, maybe comment, uh, subscribe. We really believe God has something great in store for you, as we believe God has something great in store for all of you in this room as well. Uh, and so we are in our Second Corinthians study, and we are going verse by verse through the book of Second Corinthians. And I want to thank you. Um, that as we have been talking about in the last couple of weeks about sorrow and comfort, right? That when, uh, when you keep your eyes focused on Jesus, sorrow and comfort can coexist when you are looking at the cross. And I expressed last week in the first service, and then I became a crying mess at the second service. Of course, that's the one that got recorded. And so uh, it is on there. Um, and so um, I just want to thank you. Uh, last week was really difficult, um, but your love, your support, your text messages, your emails was such a blessing. Uh, I want to thank everyone who is watching um, just how much you loved me and supported me as we talk about this concept, this idea of suffering uh, and comfort coexisting in the cross. And so we're going verse by verse through 2 Corinthians, um, and he, we have moved past just his introduction. I mean, his only his introduction to the church is talking about this craziness of suffering and comfort coexisting. And we're moving into the heart of his letter. Remember, we have talked about this for the past couple of weeks, that good speaking, elegant, um, false teachers have come into the church. And because they're good speaking, elegant, false teachers, um, the church is like, man, we really like this guy. Let's listen to their false teaching. And, and Paul had to plan a, you know, a painful visit. Um, he had to have some conversations to kind of discredit uh, these false teachers because what they were trying to do is discredit Paul. Um, they, uh, he, he sends this letter. He has this painful visit. Uh, some people repent, but the other people do not repent. And of course the false teachers do not repent. And they start to discredit Paul's authority, basically saying that Paul has no authority. And so he lays out in the very beginning of this book that of course he has no authority. Jesus has all the authority and Jesus has then given him this authority and they start to challenge his love. They start to challenge his genuineness. And so we see Paul at the beginning of this letter defend himself in the next few verses. Uh, and he does it actually in a very unique way. And I think today's message is going to be very unique for many of us because we don't think like this and we don't talk like this. So let's kind of press in. We're going to look at one verse at this moment and we're going to look at three verses total today because there's a lot of stuff in just three verses. Uh, so let's dive in. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 12, 13, and 14 today. But let's just look at verse 12. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we uh, behaved in, this, in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not in earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and, the, and supremely so towards you. Now that's a unique statement, right? He says, for our boast. Webster's Dictionary defines boasting as a praise of oneself extravagantly in speech. To speak of oneself with excess pride. And that word boast doesn't really seem to describe the Christian world. It seems to describe our current state of affair, right? We live in a world where excessive pride is constantly on display. We live in a society that celebrates expressive individualism as long as everyone films it. Think about it. You got to get the right angle on your right steak, on your right hamburger, just so you can get just enough likes and just enough comments. Like, it's just a dumb hamburger. Eat it. Just don't take a picture of it. Like, there are literally entire people whose sole job is just to randomly dance in public so that you can like and comment and share and do those things. I am addicted right now to 
people filming the people filming themselves and then commenting about the people filming themselves, it's hilarious because you just see a random person in the street doing this. And at that point in time, someone's coming. You don't hear any music. You just hear these people going like, look how stupid these people are. And But the reality of this whole process that we have in this world is look at me. Look what I can do. Look how focused I am. We are a very uh, pride-filled culture. We have a, a culture that literally says, indulge in your fantasies as long as you place it on social media. Just put the camera down. Focus on who you are. We are currently living in a generation where we capture multiple angles of our society's greatness and how lost our society actually is. We are filled with a world, our world is filled, our culture is filled with a worldly pride. It's boastful. But then Paul says, for he boasts. So if we can look at boastfulness and say, well, that doesn't seem to add up to what it means to be a Christ follower. And here is Paul saying that he is, he is boasting there has to be some sort of difference. There has to be a change. And this is, this is so important for us to understand these next three verses, just to understand these few words. And it really, what Paul is getting at here is it boils down to our focus. See, ladies and gentlemen, there is a worldly boasting versus heavenly boasting. Really, the Bible encourages us to boast. And it may not be a statement you've ever heard a pastor say. But the Bible encourages you to boast, not in a worldly boasting, but in a heavenly boasting. Uh, look what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah chapter 9 says this in verses 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. So this is what God says to us. Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or the strong boast in their strength or the rich boast in their riches. This is exactly what the world is doing right now. He says, but let the ones who boast, boast about this. This is what God says we are to boast about. That we, uh, that they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. See, we as believers should only boast in the fact that we have a relationship with God, that we have the opportunity to step into his throne room and articulate or have conversations with the holy God, that he is a God who, who exercises kindness, that he exercises justice, he exercises righteousness. And so this is vitally important as we understand this verse that Paul was laying out. What Paul is saying here is that his boasting is found in Christ. His boasting is found in God. This term for boasting, Paul actually uses it in numerous letters. He actually uses it like 47 times. Half of those times that he uses this concept of boasting, he uses in this book alone. And so Paul is setting up a foundation for those in the church to see that earthly achievements or even elegant speech isn't something true believers brag about. Remember, the false teachers were coming in and going, look how great I am. I talk so great. I say great things. You should follow me. <clears throat> and Paul is laying out that we do not do that. As believers, we do not boast in that. All we boast in is that we have the ability to know Christ. But you and I both know, as Christ followers, that this is a very fine line. Very fine line that we walk between boasting in ourselves, a worldly aspect, and boasting in that of Christ. Because you and I both have a default setting. Our default setting is pride. Scripture calls it your old self. That if you don't have your mind captive, if you are not thinking on the things of world, uh, 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 things of heavenly world and not things of this world, that you will eventually just instantly step back into your default setting of pride, default setting of an old self. So then how do we walk this fine line? How do we rebel against the things of the world? Well, I have um, three uh, tips that I want to give you to help you keep your focus, and they'll pop up on the screen. The first one 
is sudden shifts. How do you move from a worldly boasting to a heavenly boasting? The first one is sudden shifts. This means you have to move from success to servant. This is our first step. See, we are prideful people, and if we are not careful, we will slip back into a prideful state. And you may be saying, well, Pastor, I will never slip back into a prideful state. You just did. <laughs> and it's self-righteousness. And it's just that fast. And so what we have to do is we need to guard our hearts and guard our minds and move from success to servant. We need to move from, look how great I am, look at all the good things I have done, even if they are godly things. Look at all these godly things I have done. Look at me, look how great I am. Success to servant. Oh, praise God that you used a wretch like me. Oh God, I am just so thankful that I was even allowed to be used by you. See, it's a, just a... It's a sudden shift going from look at the great things I've done to, oh, thank you, God, for even using me. From success to servant, we have to start changing our language because when we start changing our language, it'll change our focus. The second thing is we need to align, have aligned attention. Once you make the shift, you have to keep the shift. And this only happens when our minds and our hearts are in step with the Holy Spirit. This is where you, uh, you choose to have a captive over a chaotic mind. We've been talking about this for the last, really, couple weeks, right? We were joking yes, last week about uh, how you like your eggs, right? Free-ranged eggs, chickens to caged chickens, right? We joked about that. And uh, the reality is, for us as Christ followers, a chaotic mind is a free-ranged mind. You want free-range chickens. That's what I've been told. Chris and Natalie tell me I want free-range chickens, not caged chickens. And so in that reality is you want, but you want to have a captive mind, not a free-range mind. Because a free-range mind that is not submissive to that of the Holy Spirit will destroy you, will run wild on you, and you will constantly get out of alignment. And so you must keep your mind submissive to the things of Christ. And how do you do that? It's through Scripture. Scripture is vital to keeping your attention aligned. How can your mind be submissive if it doesn't know what to submit to? And then lastly, I think the three ways that you can keep your, uh, uh, keep your uh, heart uh, or your mind to a heavenly boast instead of an earthly boast is you need focused friendships. Bad company corrupts good character, 1 Corinthians 15. Who you have around you can determine and most likely will determine your future. You do not need hype men. You do not need yes men. You do not, listen, this is so important and so contrary to everything the world is telling you right now. You do not need people to tell you who you can be. You need people telling you who God sees you to be. There's a drastic difference. You need people who encourage you with encouraging words, not empowering words. Empowerment, empowering words, empowering statements, that is all the rage right now. That is extremely dangerous for that of a believer. You need encouraging words, not empowering words. The reality is empowerment by definition means the power a person has to change or do something in their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, that is pride. You can't do anything. You can't fix anything. You can't change anything. And if anything changes in your life, it is only because of the grace of God who gave it to you. Amen. And so when you, when you have friends around you who just like, just be you. You can do it. You can achieve. I believe in you. That is a very dangerous friend because that friend will move you. Now, listen. As I'm saying this sentence, you go, whoa, I thought that's what we need in our lives. No, that is not what we need in our lives. We do not, pe we do not need people in our lives to encourage us or to empower us to be more like us. We need people in our lives to encourage us to be more like Christ, who will come alongside us 
and use encouraging words and push us to the gospel. See, the reality is, as you're walking this fine line, if you have focused friendships, as you start to veer off a little bit and get a little bit into se- back into self, what do they do? They point you back to a sudden shift. And they go, whoa, 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 man. I see this in your life, and I love you enough to go, hey, man, let's get back over to being a servant, not being success. See, when you start to move, when you have friends in your life that are focused, that love you enough to come alongside you and go, hey, man, your alignment's a little bit off. Uh, My car's alignment was off the other day. How did I know my car's alignment was off the other day? My dad walked over and says, dude, your tires are balding on one little side. And I said, oh, I didn't even realize that. Because why? It's on my passenger side. I never walk over and look at that tire. You know how you're supposed to check all of your tires, check all your blinkers, make sure all that works before you get in the car? I never do that. And the reality of the situation, I knew my alignment was out because someone came and told me, hey, man, your alignment's out. We need focused friends like that who will love us enough and go, hey man, let's get back into focus. Let's get back onto being a servant in Christ and having those people in our lives. And so at this point in time, we realize this cycle, right? You, you have a, a focused friend that loves us, that encourages us and brings us back to a sudden shift. We get back in alignment to God to where we're a servant to God, not our successes like the false teachers of 2 Corinthians. And we get back into this alignment and we stay in alignment through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we start to get back out, focused friends encourages us and gets us back into the cycle. And we start this cycle all over again. And that is sanctification ladies and gentlemen. And so Paul is laying this out to think about these things. And so then from that understanding of keeping our focus on God, constantly boasting about the things of God, putting our focus and our hearts on the mind of God, now that we understand those three words, let's look at the next verse or look at the rest of the verse. Let's go back and look at it. For our boast is this. The testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity. So Paul is defending himself from worldly um, boasting false teachers by saying his defense is his conscience. That's an interesting way to word it, and it's an interesting way to say things. Paul is saying that he has a clear conscience. He can put his head down on his pillow and sleep at peace at night because he knows that he, in this world, has lived a godly focus. It's interesting for him to use the word word conscience because we don't use the word conscience in the church much any. We think of Jiminy Cricket when you think of the conscience— But from the pulpit, you don't hear people talk about conscience. But the reality is, if you've done historical studies on the word conscience over the last couple hundred years, theologians have talked about conscience for really the last, up until the last 150 years, the church constantly talked about your conscience. And a switch happened, and we don't talk about it anymore. There's Thomas Aquinas talked about it. Martin Luther talked about his conscience. Look at this quote that Martin Luther, the start of the Reformation, nailed the, the thesis to the Catholic wall. He says this, unless I am convinced or uh, by sacred scripture or by evident reason, he says this, <coughs> I cannot recant for my conscience is held captive by the word of God. And to act against conscience is either neither right nor safe. Interesting to think that, that here's a guy uh, hundreds of years ago was talking about how he, his mind is seared, his conscience is seared, and that he can't act against his conscience. I think the reason why we don't talk about conscience anymore in the church is because we've allowed the sciences to steal conscience and to wrap it and tie it up with your emotions. The reality is when we think of conscience, we always think of our emotions. Well, my conscience makes me feel a certain way. Well, I feel this, so then that's what I should do. You see it now all across the board. You can act and live any way you want to live because that's how you feel. This is a very dangerous place when your conscience is tied to your feelings. 
an extremely dangerous place for a Christian. Let me restate it a different way. When a Christian allows their emotions, not the word of God, to drive their actions, they are jumping into an ocean of quicksand, expecting, expecting it to support their weight. Your emotions will never sustain you. They will never be able to give you what you need. Do your emotions have a place? Yes, but it is not first place. And this society tells you your emotions are first place. Your, your conscience is a lot like the moon. Think about the moon. The moon doesn't give off light. The moon only reflects light. And when the moon is in the right position, more light is reflected, right? You've ever walk down the beach with your, with your bride hand in hand and the moon is out and you can see everything and it is bright, almost like daytime because the moon is in the right position reflecting the light. But then there are other nights that you can't see the moon anywhere and it's dark outside. Why? Because the moon is not in the right position in which to reflect the light. Um... Our conscience is the same way. The more and more you refuse to listen to your conscience and the more and more you listen to your emotions, the quieter, the dimmer your conscience will become. A conscience fully soaked in the word of God is like a GPS for a Christian. Like, I hate driving. Like, I hate it. Like, you'll notice Time and time again, if we ever meet you somewhere, Brittany drives everywhere. Why? Because I despise driving. I'm not good at it. Don't tell Brittany that because I will, I am a great driver, but I am horrible at driving. I am really bad with directions. Like I get lost really easily. I turn off the wrong road. I do all those things. And for a season of time after I graduated college, um, I drove a white panel van around Jacksonville and delivered cleaning supplies, ladies and gentlemen. Like, it was bad. And, and back then, like, there wasn't GPS. I know, for some of you young kids, you were shocked. Like, what, what do you mean there wasn't GPS? Like, I didn't have a phone that had GPS on it. I had what was called MapQuest. Does anyone else remember MapQuest? Like, you had to print it up. And so then at that point in time, I had like 60 stops I had to do. And so every morning, because I don't know directions and I get lost really easily, I had to go in and I had to print from point A to point B, then from point B to point C, point C to point D, A, E, F, and 50, 60 different stops. And if I got off on the wrong road, the wrong turn point, missed this, turn left instead of right, I'm done. Like, I'm calling my dad at 21 years old, crying because I'm downtown, lost, and I have no idea where I'm at. Like, I turned down a one-way one -way road in downtown Jacksonville, and I didn't know I was even going down a one-way road till people were honking, screaming. There was a lady literally running beside me, going like this, yelling at me. And I'm running down a, driving down a one-way road in downtown Jacksonville in a panel van, man. I look like a creeper. And it was filled with toilet paper and bleach, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it was in. And I hated it. Now I have a GPS. Does it mean now I get, don't get lost? No, of course. I still get lost all the time. I still make wrong turns all the time. But here's the thing. The GPS will always get me back on track. I may have to look at the kids and say, hey, kids, let's turn down the music. Let's be quiet a little bit. Let's cut out the distractions so that I can hear the GPS. But as I listen to the GPS, it gets me back on on track. This is a conscience soaked in the word of God. When you have a conscience soaked in the word of God, it, you will get off track. Why? Because you're not perfect. The reality is you are jacked up. You need Jesus. And so you will get off track, but a conscience soaked in the word of God will get you back to where God wants you to be. Some of you right now, your conscience is trying to tell you not to do something, but you're allowing outside noise 
to drown out that voice. On top of the outside noise potentially drowning out, you also may have soaked your conscience in the wrong bucket. See, your conscience is fluid. It's not fixed. You ever heard it this way? Garbage in, garbage out. See, when you soak your conscience with garbage, when you soak your conscience with uh, anything other than the word of God, when you soak your conscience with your feelings, it will affect you. It will affect uh, the warning bells you have. What you look at, what you listen to, what you allow into your heart, allow into your marriage, allow into your soul will affect you. I had the wonderful opportunity, a church member flies airplanes. And I had the wonderful opportunity, uh, almost a year ago today, uh, we went to the Bahamas to look at the, the wreckage down there. And he has these glasses. And they're super weird, but they are meant to cover your eyes. The glasses are designed that as any new flyer is to wear them, they are to come in such a way that the plane, the guy who's flying the plane, cannot see the windows. Now, I know for each and every one of you, you go, what do you, what do you mean he can't see the windows? Like, a pilot is not supposed, like, when you drive a car, you must look out your window. I encourage everyone to look out your window. <laughs> when, when, when James gave me these glasses, he said, do not use these driving, you will crash. But when you fly an airplane, you're encouraged not to look out your window. They literally give you these glasses to prevent you from looking out your window. Why? Because they want you to trust your gauges. They want you to look at all of the gauges because the gauges are right. See, when you are in your airplane and you're flying in an airplane and you are at night, you fly through a crowd, uh, a cloud, you, you see a, you fly, <laughs> don't fly through a crowd. Uh, when you fly through a cloud, if you fly through a crowd and you don't have those on, you may fly through a crowd. So uh, the reality is um, even when the horizon is far off, like flying over the ocean, um, if you're looking out your window, uh, it, it'll cause a sort of vertigo in you. Uh, and you will feel like, and I didn't know this until I was in this little two like crop duster type plane, um, like it'll start to feel like you're turning. Like you're not turning, you're level. But because your mind will start to play tricks on you because of what you see, it'll feel like you start to turn and at that point in time, if you try to overcorrect, even though your gauges are correct and your gauges are right and you're not listening to your gauges, you're listening to your eyes and you're looking at the world, it can turn you and send you into a tailspin. And this, this is where most people believe how JFK Jr. passed away. He didn't look at his gauges and they looked at the horizon. Well, why do I say all of that? So many point in time when you start looking at the world around you, your perception will begin to lie to you. And you will start seeing things in a false way. You will start soaking your conscience in a negative way. Every pilot is trained. Every pilot wears those glasses in which to train their mind to focus on their gauges, not their horizon. That should be the same concept for a Christ follower. It should be the same concept for you and I. Joshua words it this way. When God is talking to Joshua, my favorite book, first book I ever preached here as a pastor, God tells him this. Look what Joshua chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. <coughs> be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and 
successful. Keep your eyes on the gauges. He goes on to say this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. How can Joshua be courageous? How can Joshua be strong? Was it because he had the best army? No. He had a bunch of, basically a bunch of ancestors or children of slaves. They weren't, they weren't military experts. They basically just had a sword and they tried to point the pointy end in the other guy. So they didn't have the best army. Did they have the most men? No. They were taking over an entire region. They didn't have the most men. Did they have fortified castles? No. Did they have the best military strategy? No. Think about the story of Jericho and think of it in a military tactic. God says, walk around this fortified city for seven days and just yell at it. Like that was it. I didn't sh don't shoot, don't dig underneath it. Don't try to cast bombs at it. Don't try to do this. Don't try to do any of those things. Just walk around it and yell at it. And the walls came tumbling down. He didn't have the best military strategy. He didn't have the biggest army. He didn't have the best army. He didn't have fortified cast castles. How could J Joshua face or overcome anything? Because his eyes, they were not focused on the battle ahead. They were focused on the words and promises of God. See, his conscience was clean because it was soaked in the word of God. And so at this point in time, what Paul is laying out here is that he has a heavenly boast, keeping his eyes and focused on Jesus. And because he kept his eyes and focused on Jesus, his conscience is now soaked in that of God, soaked in the concept of God, soaked in the word of God. And he uses that to defend himself against prideful, arrogant, false teachers. And we pick up and end this sermon with these last two verses. Look at verses 13 and 14. For you're, we are not writing you anything other than what you read and understand. And I hope you will fully understand, just as you did uh, particularly understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we boast of you. What is Paul saying here? He's basically saying, hey, listen, my message, it wasn't flashy. It wasn't very good. The reality is, I should have said cloud, but I said crowd and all those different things. It wasn't perfected. It wasn't all those things. What was it? It was just simple gospel. Simple gospel messages. And then he uses this concept of, of boasting again at the time of Jesus' return. He's talking about how excited he is that the church, when they stand faithful and stand strong in the Lord, have a focused friendship, that he's, he's encouraging them to, 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 to return back, to, to make a sudden shift back, that when they do those things, the group of people can stand before Jesus at the end of times and go like, look at all these believers. Look how strong they are in the Lord. God, look how you used me. Look how you used us to grow us in the gospel. And God, thank you that you would use such a wretched person like me to grow people in you. And then the church can look back and go, you know what, Jesus? We were a little bit off and a little bit broken and we ran after things of this world. But thank you that you would use a broken person like Paul to, to bring a repented person back to Christ so we can praise you. And at the end of all days, a bunch of jacked up people can look at a holy God and go, God, we got nothing to offer you except to say, thank you for using us. That's the church. None of us are good. None of us are great. Your own pastor can't talk. I have jacked up learning disabilities and God gave me a job around a book. <laughs> like what? But at the end of this all, the only thing we get to boast about is how great our God is Amen. and how he used us to bring more people to himself. 
And so I end this sermon, I end this, this with this concept that it's, that the, the outcome of a church shouldn't be a massive wave of church attenders. The outcome of the church should be believers being convicted, converted, and challenged in the gospel. Now, this doesn't mean that churches can't be large. What it means is, what is the source of their largeness? Is it cool programs, a funny communicator? Or is it God-centered growth through God-centered conviction found in their conscience? And so I end with this. What is your God-centered conscience telling you to flee from? Right now, your God-centered conscience, what is it telling you to flee from? What is your God-centered conscience telling you to flee from that you've been ignoring? And lastly, what does God's word say? And does your conscience align with that? And if it doesn't, then you're soaking your conscience in worldly things. Get off of looking outside and put your focus back on your gauge, God's word, and rest in the confidence that you can trust your gauges, even when the outside world looks extremely wonky. So may we be challenged to check our hearts today and see if they align with the things of Jesus. Let me pray for you. So dearly, Father God, thank you for this word. Thank you for this challenge. God, thank you for those in this room right now that they have a sudden shift. That if they realize that their conscience, that their boastfulness, that their hearts are not on the things of you, God, may they have a sudden shift and get back to you. God, may they, may they align their attention <coughs> to the things of you. God, may they have godly friends to come and put an arm around them, focused friends, and encourage them back to the gospel. And so, God, at this moment, may this church not just be a standing church that just stands and sings some songs, but, God, may this be a church that is convicted. May this altar be filled with men and women praying for their hearts to be clean, or, Lord Jesus, down at the altar praying for their friends' hearts to be clean. But may this altar be filled with men and women calling on the throne room of God, crying out, say, God, I don't want to be successful. All I want to be is your servant. God, move in such a way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you stand with me?